We did a couple of updates earlier on about Star Trek The Motion Picture. They were, oddly enough, called 20 Things You Didn't Know About Star Trek The Motion Picture. Now, we are really, really proud of those videos. Chris Thompson, our editor, did an absolutely knockout job of making a documentary based on a fantastic article by both Michael Kamet and Morris Molneau. So the only thing that we're here to do today is we're just gonna address just a couple of little factual things that came up subsequent to publishing the video. Now, it's still a fantastic set of videos. I recommend you go and check them out. The links for them are in the description for this video. But without any further delay, here is 20 things you never knew about Star Trek The Motion Picture, part three. So the first point to address is about ticket sales in the US. Now, what we said is that of the roughly 1.1 billion tickets sold in the US in 1979, Star Trek The Motion Picture accounted for roughly 23% of ticket sales by year end. We first learned this information from a book by Cheryl and Connolly, which was about bringing Star Trek The Motion Picture to life. Now, what we subsequently found out was basically we went and we did the maths, okay? So if 23% of all ticket sales in 1979 went to Star Trek The Motion Picture based on the cost of tickets at the time, that would have equated to roughly $650 million at the box office. Now, Star Trek The Motion Picture, while being a very successful film, didn't make anything like that. It actually made closer to $83 million. Still, in 1979, nothing to turn your nose up at. But something else to consider is that that box office, that roughly $83 million, that also includes ticket receipts from January and February of 1980 as well, which wouldn't be factored in to the 23% of 1979. The wording of the source article was a little bit vague. So by year's end of 1979, sure, but what it actually refers to is in December of 1979. So actually, Star Trek The Motion Picture accounted for roughly 23% of ticket sales in the final month of 1979. So still a very successful film, but not quite Avengers Endgame levels of successful. Now, the unit production manager, what we said is that Phil Stewart was the unit production manager on Star Trek The Motion Picture. Actually, that was a typo. The actual unit production manager on Star Trek The Motion Picture was a gentleman called Phil Rawlins, who passed away in 2009. The visual effects photographer on Star Trek The Motion Picture was a gentleman called Dave Stewart. So unfortunately, along the way, there was a little bit of a, a typo and a bit of a crossed wires. So Dave Stewart, visual effects photographer, Phil Rawlins, unit production manager. Fun fact about Phil Rollins is that he also served as UPM on Gremlins and Gremlins 2, both of which were scored by Jerry Goldsmith, who, of course, created the most fantastic soundtrack to any film ever. He also directed several episodes of the original series. Klingon Hull, Chen Mahul. You try speaking Klingon without coffee, all right? Now, what we said was that James Doohan, who, of course, played Scotty, was the original creator in whole of the Klingon language. Now that's partly true. So what we should have said is that John Pavel, who was an associate producer on the film, also worked with Jimmy Doohan on this. And after the work had already been put in by another linguist called Harmut Scarf. Now, Mr. Scarf had actually created the Vulcan overdubs for the motion picture. So there was a lot of collaboration when it came to the different languages in this film, but it wouldn't have been entirely accurate to say that it was just James Doohan who originated the Klingon language. And that is something that I myself have said in other articles as well. So let's, let's put that one out there. Jimmy Doohan, brilliant man, fantastic engineer, very good linguist, not afraid to ask for a bit of help when the time came. So John Pavel and Harmut Scarf were all, it was a bit of a melting pot. And actually just one last thing about Harmut Scarf is that he had created an entire language, not in the same way that Mark Ockwin did, but he had created something that John Pavel actually decided wasn't quite alien enough for the Klingon language. So it seems that when it came to Scarf's expertise in creating an alien language, 
absolutely fine for the Vulcans. Klingons have got to go a different direction. Them's the brakes. And then our final point that we want to address is we said that not until Star Trek 2009 would Paramount again start looking for A-list directors for Star Trek. And that is, so this one is more of a, more of a wording kind of speculation thing we want to fix. So in a way, we're correct. In another way, we're sort of taking it for granted. If you think back to Star Trek First Contact, uh, Jonathan Frakes gave several interviews along the way about how he won the role as the director. Now, what he said in one article was that after Ridley Scott and John McTiernan had turned down the film, he was approached. Now, Ridley Scott and John McTiernan both have very, very successful resumes. However, we couldn't find a confirmation on that, but what we did find is another interview again, again with Jonathan Frakes, where he says that after Paramount realized that they weren't going to get Ridley Scott or James Cameron this time to direct a Star Trek, he was given the job. So when it comes to 2009 and you've got J.J. Abrams, technically he wasn't an A-lister, at the time, certainly not in film. He would have been on television, with both Alias and Lost were obviously really, really impressive, successful shows, but still technically not an A-list director. However, this, this one is more of a, a technicality. It's more that we're kind of, we're addressing the fact that speculation-wise, yes, they, they didn't approach any other A-listers. However, we don't know what went on in that room, and there's certainly suggestions that they didn't discount anyone along the way. So that is what we hopefully have cleared up for you there. There's a time and a place for speculation, but when going through the facts in a 40 year old film, that isn't it. And you can trust me on that one. I have a degree in history. Yep. Now that's all the updates for this video. Please do check out parts one and two of our, frankly, documentary on Star Trek The Motion Picture. Again, absolutely stellar work was put in by Chris Thompson in creating that video, videos I should say, it's so big we split it into two. And again, massive, massive thanks to Michael Kamet and Morris Monio for putting together the fantastic article and in fact putting together this addressing of those factual errors as well. I have been Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture. You can find me over at Trek Culture on Twitter. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe this video. Please don't forget to check out the other two parts. Have yourself a fantastic, however long it is until I see you again, make sure that you live long and prosper. <laughs>